protocol for unity. Alafia, I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore Peace, host and producer of the H3O show. And the show is titled Investing in Your Future. It should have been titled Investing in the Dream because that's the name of one of the books that has been written by our guest, Jesse Brown. And I've invited Jesse B. Brown here to talk about money and to talk about investments and finances in ways that I hope that the viewing audience will relate to because I know nothing at all about the subject matter. So I'm just gonna be happy to say hello and then just sit here and ask you questions that I think my audience might like the answers to. First of all, I'd like to like you to tell the audience what it is, what it is that you do, how you came to do it, and what you are doing right now. Well, first of all, Dr. Peace, let me thank you very much for inviting me on your program. Your program is one of the most popular programs on the channel, and to be on your program is a great honor. The way I came to doing investing and saving and investing lecturing, it really is kind of an interesting story. I started out as a as a stockbroker for a major uh, brokerage house here in Chicago after spending some time in Washington working for the uh, federal government in the Department of of Treasury. And after a while, it came to uh, mind that perhaps people needed more than just transactions as it relates to their stock, bond, and, and uh, interest rate portfolios, and that they really need to understand what was really taking place, especially African Americans. As you know, Dr. Peace, if we pulled all of our monies and our wealth together in the African American community, we'd have between four and five hundred billion dollars each and every year. Now you equate that kind of money in the world economy, we'd be the tenth or the eleventh largest nation in the world. We're, we're, we're a country all into ourselves in terms of the way we handle our wealth. But unfortunately, we don't put that wealth together in a way where we can really progress. So when I decided to write my book, Investing in the Dream, Wealth Building Strategies for African Americans, what I was trying to put together was the knowledge that we could use as a people to provide wealth building strategies for our people. This is why I got involved in the whole investment and savings uh, business in the first place. My background is I, I, I have a, a terminal degree in business and finance from Northwestern University. My I have alma a, mater. Yeah, it's a, it's a great school, the Kellogg School of, of Business. I, yes. I, I love it. Took and some courses over there. Yeah, and, and last year they, uh, they, uh, they elected me as the alumni of the year, so I'm very, very proud of that. And then uh, after that, I went back and started my own firm, and my firm is called and what we do is we provide transaction services in the areas of stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and retirement planning for people who are interested in, pre in preparing a personal financial plan. And at, at, while doing that, I've had an opportunity to write uh, two books. My first book was Pay Yourself First, a Guide to Financial Success. It's a very popular book. A local bank here in town uh, for, for about a year gave it away as a, as a customer or a service item for everyone who decided they wanted to open up uh, a new bank account or new uh, savings account, a new mutual fund investment account. And just recently I finished uh, my second book. Now just recently I've released a six tape set series as a recording of one of my seminars. I have been very popular on the seminar circuit recently talking about all the various ways that people can go around saving and investing and developing strategies to prepare for their retirement. So hopefully as we talk uh, today I'll get an opportunity to tell you more about the uh, audio tape set series that is just now available uh, you know, in various bookstores or wherever you want to go get your books. But the most important thing is to really convey that the opportunity of becoming wealthy in America is such today greater than it's ever been before. And that's what we want to talk about during our, our time today. The first thing I want to do is ask you about the vocabulary of investment. We hear terms like stocks, bonds, NASDAQ, 
Dao. Those are foreign terms to many of us. <laughs> Tell us something about these terms and any other terms that are frequently used that may have some meaning for us or implications for us. You know, it's interesting that you would ask that question, Dr. Uh, Pease, because in the beginning, you know, this whole Dow Jones average that you hear about mm -hmm. every day, mm -hmm. you can't turn on a newscast or a radio program without them saying the Dow Jones is up or the Dow Jones is down. Mm -hmm. you, know, it, you know, what does that really mean? Well, mm -hmm. in writing my book, Investing in the Dream, and preparing my audio tape series, which is called Pathway to Your Dreams, mm -hmm. uh, I tell the story about exactly how all of that got started. Mm -hmm. If you if you don't mind, I'll just Go tell right it again. Ahead. Tell it again right now. Well, back in the 1920s and 30s when they were putting together this mysterious Dow Jones index, the way it started was this. A Mr. Dow mm -hmm. and a Mr. Jones mm -hmm. got together one day in New York on Wall Street. They were traders on on the stock exchange and he said Mr. Dow, do we make any money today? And Mr. Jones says, well, I'm not really sure. I sold some things. I bought some things. But, you know, I, we really have no accounting system. So he said, look, let's do this. Let's call today one. Everything we did today, we're just going to call it one. And tomorrow, we'll add it up again. And if we make money, we'll call it two. And if we make money the next day, we'll call it three, four, five, six, and so on. Now, a day that we lose, we'll just take away from that number and call it five, four, three, two, or whatever the number happens to be. Mm -hmm. It's really that simple. Mm -hmm. The Dow Jones average number mm -hmm. that you hear is really not a percentage number at all. Mm -hmm. It is just a set of stocks that an organization now, Mr. Dow and Mr. Jones are no longer with us, mm -hmm. but now they have a company, mm -hmm. and what they do is they take a set of stocks, mm -hmm. 30 of them in mm -hmm. the industrial uh, average, 30 in the transportation average, mm -hmm. 30 in their combination average, mm -hmm. and they take these particular stocks, mm -hmm. and they look at the value of those stocks on a particular day. Mm -hmm. If it goes up, they average it out and say, we're up another point. Mm -hmm. We're up two more points today. Mm -hmm. And that's all it is. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else to it than just that kind of movement. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why I, I put it in terms like that is because many of us remember back in 1987 when we had that, you know, infamous crash. But we never understood what imp impact it had on the life of the community. Well, that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. What was going on right n at that point is that that Dow Jones average mm -hmm. had moved over the years, one, two, three, four, just like I explained, mm -hmm. it moved up to the number 2,700, mm -hmm. 2,700. Mm -hmm. in a, in a, on a certain day in October mm -hmm. uh, in 1987, that particular number, 2,700, mm -hmm. dropped 10%. That means it went down 270 points mm -hmm. on that particular day. And then the next day, it dropped another 10%. Mm -hmm. And what happened was everyone was panicking because they remembered back in the 20s and 30s, when the Dow Jones average went down to a very small number, mm -hmm. and that was called the Depression. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened in October of 1987 was that it went down 10% and went down another 10%, mm -hmm. and the stock market, the exchanges, stopped doing business. Mm -hmm. They just says, wait a minute. We're not going to buy. We're not going to sell mm -hmm. anymore today. Mm -hmm. And what happened then is the traders, you know, left. They went outside and they noticed that the cars were still going and the lights were still on, mm -hmm. and th and the panic was over. Mm -hmm. So in the in the weeks that followed, mm -hmm. the Dow Jones average moved from 2,700 to 2,800 mm -hmm. to 2,900 till today it's almost at 11,000. Mm. So, now I'm going to give your viewers the secret to success in the stock market right now. Uh. Now, those of you who are listening and watching us may want to take out a pencil and paper now because what, what I'm going to share with you now is the secret. And the secret is simply this. Buy low, sell high. We've heard that <laughs> secret before. Well, let but me buy what low and 
Well, that's my that's the point that I'm trying to make about this okay. Dow Jones okay. mysterious average. Okay. Everyone thought that it was going to be low, mm -hmm. and they thought it was just going to move to a crash mm -hmm. scenario. Mm -hmm. But America being what it is, guess what happened? It just rebounded. Mm -hmm. In other words, it was a correction on that mm -hmm. day mm -hmm. in October uh, 1987. It wasn't a crash at mm -hmm. all. So what happened was it rebounded. Mm -hmm. And those of my clients and people that I knew, what they saw was a buying opportunity. So they saw it going lower and they n believed in America, they believed in the American economic system, so they purchased. So people who bought in October of 1987, mm -hmm. November 1987, mm -hmm. have had their money double and double and double again. Mm -hmm. Now, a very interesting thing is going on in America right now. We've just had an election a month or so ago. We have a new president in place. A lot of new policies are being put into uh, fruition right now. Mm -hmm. And guess what? The stock market doesn't know what to do. Consequently, things are very low now. Mm -hmm. They're kind of at an even pace. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, more and more people are actually talking about a recession mm -hmm. now. Well, if that happens, well, we could lose some ground on the stock market. Mm -hmm. But again, remember, Dr. Peace, what I told you a few minutes ago. Buy low. Buy low. America is still America. We're the leading economic power in this world. So it may not be this month or next month, but over the next year, two, or three, the market will rebound. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of dollar cost averaging and buying to keep up with things. Mm -hmm. Now that's another term that a lot of people hear that they don't really understand. Dollar, dollar cost, cost averaging. averaging. Let me explain what dollar cost averaging means. Dollar cost averaging means that each and every week you purchase something in the marketplace. Now some weeks it'll be high, some weeks it'll be low, but over a period of time what you've done is you've bought at an average price. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why that's extremely important is because if you do nothing and you don't buy today and you wait until the time when you think it's going to be low, mm -hmm. guess what? It's too high. Mm -hmm. Too many, especially African Americans, have been sitting on the sideline and not participating in the American economy to their fullest extent because they keep thinking things are too high. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you something. Every time you sit on the sidelines waiting for things to get lower, guess what? It gets a little higher. Mm -hmm. I talk about that in my book. Mm -hmm. I have a friend. His name is Marty Sims. I love Marty. Marty's a great guy. I met Marty when I was working at the post office. Now, Dr. Peace, you may look at me and you say, Jesse, you worked at the post office? I worked at the post office. That's absolutely correct. A lot of our viewers don't re re realize that the post office was what my mother used to call a good government job. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and so while I had my, uh, my little time at the post office, I met a guy named Martin Sims. Well, Martin's a great guy. He was the postmaster of Washington, D.C., and when he retired back in 1976 when I was working at the post office, he had about 100 people come to his retirement party. And as you know, postal people are great people. Mm -hmm. Boy, I tell you, they really put on a really nice party for him. Mm -hmm. There was about 100 people there. Well, he said to them, he said, I just love you people to come out on my day of retirement. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do the postal thing. That's right. He reached into his pocket and he pulled, you no, know, Dr. Peace, he wasn't going to shoot anybody. <laughs> <laughs> what he was going to do was send them a postal card each Christmas telling them how he was doing and wishing them well. Mm -hmm. Okay, back in 1976, you remember that was the bicentennial year. Mm -hmm. Those beautiful stamps, you remember mm -hmm. them, Washington crossing the Delaware, mm -hmm. those, you know, pictures from the portrait gallery in Washington, mm -hmm. they were 13 cents. Okay, so he committed for the 100 people there $13 out of his $790 postal retirement check 
to wish them well at Christmas. Saw Marty a couple of years ago. It was just when the postage stamp was 33 cents. And I says, Marty, we're all doing well. Now at $13 commitment you made back in 1976, not too long ago, we're still alive. Mm -hmm. We're still doing very well. Mm -hmm. It's now a $33 commitment. And guess what? It's going to be a $34 commitment mm -hmm. not too long when the stamp goes up one penny, and then next year it's going to be up another penny, and the next year another penny. And golly, Dr. Peace, you know it's going to be 50 cents before time, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. time comes, comes along. So that shows you that inflation will track along our life period mm -hmm. in a way where we're just going to need more money. Mm -hmm. So we can't take our money, put it in a coffee can, bury it in the backyard. We must make our money work for us. That's why I encourage people to save and invest, to put money into the stock market and to let it grow. Now, a lot of people wonder, how can I put money into the stock market? Well, a lot of us work for companies that have 401k plans. Mm -hmm. That's another term that a lot of people don't understand. Mm -hmm. Now, 401k plans, or if you work for a school, uh, as you do at, at mm -hmm. the university, you might have a 403b plan, mm -hmm. or a tax-sheltered annuity if you work for the Chicago Public Schools or something like that. Or if you work for a nonprofit organization such as a hospital or, or United Way or something like that, you would have something called a 457 plan. Mm -hmm. That's a plan that allows government workers to put away a certain amount of their money into a savings and retirement plan. But let's just talk about the 401k. Notice that all of these plans begin with the number four. Mm -hmm. That four comes from the Internal Revenue Code. It's in Section 4 of the Internal Revenue Code that allows these particular retirement plans. And you can put away anywhere from 15 to 25 percent of your salary into these plans as long as it meets the criteria that the government has set aside. Mm -hmm. By putting your money into a plan like this, you're able to let your money compound. Now, if you work for a private company and you have the 401k plan, mm -hmm. your employer may just put money with it, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. That means you're getting a bonus by not only putting your money in, mm -hmm. but your employer can put money in, too, for your benefit as a, you know, as a perk, mm -hmm. as, a, as an employee benefit. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the benefit of that is quite simply, well, let me tell you, saving is a very hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I was asked once, Jesse, what is the most difficult thing in life to do? Oh, gee, I couldn't figure it out. And I looked in the mirror and I says, well, maybe dieting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then I thought, I said, you know, saving is just as difficult because it's, it's another one of those things that you want to do what? Next Monday morning. <laughs> you don't, you don't, you don't want to ever want to do it right now. Mm -hmm. And that's why a 401k plan is so good because it comes out of your paycheck mm -hmm. before you actually get the money. Mm -hmm. And by it coming out, that means you you know, somehow work off the net of what you make mm -hmm. from your employer mm -hmm. and not off the gross, trying to then find some way to save and invest. So that's why I encourage people that have a savings and investment plan at their employer to go and join it as soon as possible. That's why I wrote my book. That's why I've just finished this tape series because I want people to listen and read and understand the importance of saving and investing. Well, I wanted to try to ask you something about pay yourself first, uh, because very often people don't feel that they have discretionary income that they can use for purposes other than to take care of their obligations. So, you know, with the, with the 401k coming directly out of the paycheck, you never have the money in your hands in the first place. So you're not so tempted. But for those of us who receive their full income and who have already allocated it to all kinds of things, um, how does one adopt the, the strategy of pay yourself first? You know, how do you get yourself, how do you get yourself at the head of the line that you've already constructed 
for your uh, distribution of income. Well, let me ask you this, Dr. Peace. Have you ever taken an airline trip? What is the first thing that the flight attendant or the uh, pilot says to you when you're talking about emergency procedures? In case of emergency and the oxygen mask comes down, cover yourself first before you even help your spouse or your children. Mm -hmm. That's the same way with your money and, mm -hmm. your, and, your, and your assets. Mm -hmm. You have to prepare yourself if you're going to help anyone else. Mm -hmm. One of the items that I talk about in my book, matter of fact, I talk about it in chapter one, is a friend of mine who somehow, some way, she is the matriarch, of, found herself the matriarch of the family. Mm -hmm. Now she's not the mother or the grandmother, she's just the, she's just the daughter, but mm -hmm. somehow she's the one with the good job. Mm -hmm. So everybody kind of comes to her and says, Aunt Jackie, can you help me go to school? Mm -hmm. Or Aunt Jackie, can you help me fix my car? Mm -hmm. In other words, she's the one with the good job, mm -hmm. and she's the one that they kind of like depend on. Mm -hmm. And so she came to me and she said, there's absolutely no way that I I can do any kind of saving and investing because I have to take care of everybody else. Mm -hmm. Well, I gave her a little strategy. The strategy I gave her was she happened to work for a governmental agency and every six months or nine months or so she would get, you know, a dollar increase raise on her, dollar an hour increase raise on her, on her paycheck. Mm -hmm. And since her relatives knew her payday better than she knew her mm -hmm. payday. Mm -hmm. I said, let's just tell them you didn't get a raise this time. Mm -hmm. And so the 40 hours that you work, we're going to take that dollar increase on your salary, mm -hmm. and we're going to call it your first $40 mm -hmm. that you're going to invest. Mm -hmm. And we did that, and we did that over a two-year period to a point where she had Oh, almost $160 that she could actually save and invest. Mm -hmm. This was her way of paying herself first before she tried to take care of all the other people in her family. Mm -hmm. Now take a young woman like that, 25 years old. If she would put away $50 a month until she was age 65, mm -hmm. she would have put away $24,000 put that same amount of money into a savings account at one of the local banks, paying around 4 or 5%. That's mm -hmm. just about how much CDs or passbooks pay. Mm -hmm. Guess what? She'd have about $59,000 when, when it was time for her to retire mm -hmm. at age 65. Mm -hmm. Not a bad amount of money. Mm -hmm. But take that same $24,000, $50 a month, every month, from age 25 to age 65, put it into a mutual fund, with an average you know, rate of return of around 12%, she'd have almost $600,000. Now that's real money. Now, what if you put away $25 a week? That's $5 a day. One Big Mac Happy Meal a day. Mm -hmm. You just did without it. Not only would you lose weight, Dr. Peace, but <laughs> you would end up saving $5 a day. That's $25 a week, $100 a month. That $100 from age 25 to age 65 would be $48,000. Again, put that in one of your local banks at a, in a savings account or a passbook or something like that. You'd have, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe around $90,000, $95,000. But put that same amount of money into a mutual fund with an average rate of return of around 12%, you'd have over a million three hundred thousand dollars. Those are the kinds of things that I talk about in my book and my audio uh, cassette series. And you know, and, and, and I also talk about it in my newsletter. And anyone who wants a copy of my newsletter, they can certainly call you here at the program. And just ask for a free copy of my electronic newsletter, and I'll be more than glad to, uh, you know, put you on my email list and 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 have you uh, and have you get it. In other words, the key to success, the key to saving and investing, is to begin right now. Don't procrastinate. You're never too old. You're never too young to begin to save and invest. But you're saying, buy every week. Where, where does one get this money to buy every week? Out of the cookie jar? 
or how does one how does one or organize one's affairs so that one is able to buy every week or let's say every two weeks well it's interesting that you would bring that up dr peace because a lot of people say you know i have no money there's absolutely no way that i can find an extra nickel out of my life to do anything else with and you know and i look at people when they say that and i think about my mother and my grandmother you know think of all the benefits and, and blessings that we have today and think about our our parents and our grandparents they didn't have any of those blessings there was no affirmative action there were no good jobs they were just you know even if you go back far enough there was even slavery but somehow they managed to do what dr peace they managed to save enough money to send you to school to send me to school and to have enough money to have a home a family and have food on the table and you know it really kind of embarrasses me to think that we have all these blessings today and we can't find five dollars a day when our parents and our grandparents did so much with so little what I recommend that people do and this is one of the things that I have on my website that I would encourage people to go and look at, which is www.investinthedream.com. I have 50 ways for people to find $50 a month. Among those, those ideas is, you know, we spend a whole lot of money on things that we don't need, such as, you know, uh, cellular telephones. I mean, you know, do we just have to carry around a cellular telephone with us? Yes, we do. I Let know. me tell you why. When you're out late at night and you're going to someone's house, you want to call them up and say, look out, I'm coming, and meet me at the door so that nothing can happen to you. Well, you know, three years ago, we didn't have these cellular phones. And so somehow, you didn't go to people's <laughs> houses late at night. I think we did. I think we called them before we left home and told them we were on the way. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, when, you, when you tell that story about uh, uh, cellular phones, I'm re reminded of, of, the, uh, of the daughter that I know that uh, pulls up to a pizza parlor and orders the pizza from outside in the car so she doesn't have to get out and stand in line. People find these conveniences that, conveniences that we have today, and we, and we misuse them. And that's why I'm suggesting that people consider some of the habits that they've developed based on convenience. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, being attractive and being well-groomed is extremely important. But I know people who spend $20 uh, in a, in a heartbeat to get their fingernails done before they think about putting away $20 to, uh, to save uh, and invest. I also know people that are so fashion conscious that they have to have name brand uh, clothing for their infant toddlers that are only going to be, that are only going to be in that size for a month or two rather than uh, perhaps uh, going to a, a generic brand uh, as well as, uh, as, as, as laundry products or, or other things that, that, that we can really do without our, our, our using name brands. In other words, African Americans, as we've, as, we've, as we've grown to know by looking at our studies as we did our book, are really big into what is called conspicuous consumption. And that conspicuous consumption has us as a body of people spending our wealth as opposed to amassing our wealth. You see, what we need to do is find some way to take all these millions and millions of dollars that come through our community each and every year and find some way for it to stay there just for a little while so that we can grow and save and invest. So I think that people need to understand that the most important element in saving and investing is the discipline of budgeting. Many times as I'm putting together a financial plan for someone, I'll ask someone, just tell me, what are your bills this month? Many times people can't even you know, tell you what their bills are. They know they've got a light bill. They know they've got a gas bill. They know they've got a phone bill or, or maybe even apartment rent. But they can't tell you the exact amount of that bill because it fluctuates each and every month. Can they tell me what the average is? Can they tell me how much money they're going to need to budget from one month to the next? No, they can't. So the first step to saving and investing and to being successful at it is budgeting. 
prepare a list of your usual bills, put down what those are, and then you know exactly how much money you need to work on each month. Too many people use their credit card to balance their checkbook. And by doing that, people end up spending 8, 9, 10, sometimes 21% interest on their credit cards. That's why I wrote the book, Investing in the Dream, Wealth Building Strategies for African Americans, because I want to show people the importance of saving and investing. Now, say for instance, you have followed my suggestions. You've put together $50. What should you do next? Well, a lot of people say, well, I want to wait till I have $1,000 or $5,000 before I actually invest. Well, now mutual fund companies will take as little as $50 and let you begin a systematic investment program simply by doing a dollar cost averaging uh, program through what's called a checkomatic or a you know money that would come out of your checking account. So if you don't have a 401k plan at your job or 403b if you're in the school system or a 457 plan if you work for for a, a governmental agency, you can actually start a savings and investment plan on your own simply by going to a mutual fund company and asking them to take money directly out of your pay, uh, out of your uh, checking account each and every month. That's why I wrote the book. That's why I put together this tape series. And you know, you can get these books at any bookstore. Um, you can get it on the web. Well, you know, I do know that there is a certain amount of risk in investing. So what are you going to tell people about the risk that might be inherent in certain kinds of investments? Because, you know, it isn't all you put your money in, your money grows and increases. Sometimes your money uh, disappears. Sometimes you lose some money. So for those of us who are highly sensitive to risk, what kinds of uh, consolation or comforting words can you have for us? Well, it's interesting that you would bring up the whole question of risk because it is the most important element in terms of investing. Because if you just wanted to protect your money, as I explained a little earlier with my friend uh, from the post office, guess what? Inflation will eat away the value of that particular dollar over a period of time. So to me, that is the greatest risk. The greatest risk is to not have the purchasing power for your money over a, over a longer period of time. It is true that the stock market, any given stock, whether it's Amazon.com or whether it's Microsoft or whether it's you know Kellogg uh, cereal or United Airlines or whatever it is, will go up and down in value on any given day, any given week, any given month. But that that's what's called volatility. You asked me about words that we use in the in the marketplace. Volatility is when a particular stock or bond or mutual fund goes up and down in price over any particular given period of time. Well, that volatility lends itself to great opportunities because you're purchasing this money, purchasing this stock, purchasing this bond, purchasing this mutual fund at a volatile period where you could purchase it low and at a, at a later period it could be worth more money. So if you have no tolerance for risk whatsoever, then you can invest in something that has a low volatility. That would be something like a bond, a government bond, a savings bond. You're familiar with mm -hmm. Series E uh, mm -hmm. uh, savings bonds or, or college bonds or something like that. But the problem is when you have no volatility and the risk is very low in the investment that you have, the gain is very, very, very small. A friend of mine, Walter Payton, uh, great running back for the Chicago Bears, um, before his death was was quoted often as saying no pain no gain that's right you have to realize this volatility if you want to participate 
in the game. If you don't want to participate in the volatility, all you can be assured of is that your money will not have the same purchasing power when you're ready to do uh, your, when, when you actually need the money. Now, that brings to mind another uh, very important element that we have in the savings and investment market today. It's called the IRA, the Individual Retirement Account. Back in 1976, the government put together a program that allowed us to put away $2,000 each and every year into something called the Individual Retirement Account. That Individual Retirement Account grows tax-deferred until you take the money out. If you take the money out before you're age 59 and a half, the government penalizes you by charging you an extra 10% penalty plus your ordinary income tax on that money. Now the benefit of having an IRA is that the money grows tax deferred. That is to say you don't pay any taxes on this money until you take the money out. Now if you have an ordinary investment, say a certificate of deposit at a bank, what happens? In December or January of every year, you get something called a 1099. That 1099 you must place on your income tax uh, form and their Schedule B as income for that year. And guess what you have to do? You have to pay taxes on that money one more time. So if you put your money into an individual retirement account, an IRA, or a variable annuity, you don't pay any taxes on that money until you take the money out. So I would encourage people to do first, participate in their 401k pro program. And then the second thing is to get an individual retirement account. But more important than any of that, I encourage people to go out and read, to understand all the benefits of saving and investing and how to develop wealth within their own family. That's why I wrote my book. That's why I put together my tape series that's why I've made it available so that people can actually find out exactly how to go about saving and investing. Knowledge is the key to one's success, and reading is the key to, to that knowledge. And that's why I encourage people to first try and participate in their retirement savings plan at their work. Then I encourage people to get individual retirement accounts. Now, along the same line, I encourage people to get financial advice. You know, an old saying that I've been quoted as saying is that even Jesus had 12 friends. I mean, you need to have a financial advisor around you, much like you have an accountant or a lawyer or a doctor. You see, unfortunately, Dr. Peace, more people spend more time planning their summer vacations than they do their financial future. You know, in preparing uh, for my book, Investing in the Dream, I had the occasion to actually do a study uh, trying to determine exactly how Social Security got developed. And a lot of people depend on Social Security as their form of supplemental income in their retirement. And Dr. Peace, you'll be surprised. Back in the 1920s and 30s when they were putting together the Social Security system. There were some wise old men in Washington putting together this plan, and they had worked for almost nine months, maybe 10 months, trying to figure out what the age would be of the person to receive Social Security. And they just couldn't figure out exactly what the right age would be. They just didn't know the right, you know, year. So they called in an actuary. Now, you know what an actuary is, but maybe some of our viewers don't. An actuary is a person who would work for an insurance company who would tell that particular insurance company the mortality age, the age of death of an average person, so that insurance company can decide, you know, what to charge for life insurance. Well, you know, that actuary told those gentlemen who had been working for over nine or ten months that the average age of an American's death in the 20s and 30s was age 62. And you know what? They said, just fine. That's when we'll hand out Social Security. <laughs> mm -hmm. In other words, they never expected us mm -hmm. to live long enough 
to reap the benefits of Social Security. Mm -hmm. And that and it's a funny thing since then. Medical science has played a dirty trick on them. Now we're living longer and longer and longer. You know, I was just uh, away on vacation not too long ago, and I saw a lot of 62-year-olds, 65-year-olds <laughs> playing golf, playing <laughs> tennis, you know. Mm -hmm. Right now, I guess that's why Dr. Kevorkian and all those people in Michigan are doing so well. <laughs> you have to beg the doctor to die. They have a pill for this, they have a pill for that, a tube for this, a tube for that. You just can't you know, plan on dying at age 65. And so that's why the average mortality age of Americans today are more like, you know, 80 years old mm -hmm. because of the medicines that we have. Unfortunately, many of us are retiring at age 65. So if we retire at age 65 and we're going to live another 10, 15, 20 years and we don't have enough money, well, I'm telling you, that is real misery. You see, people worry about dying, but I'm here to tell you, the worst thing that can happen to you is that you live. And if you live and you're sick or you don't have enough money to live comfortably in your retirement, that can be a very miserable state. And that's why I encourage people to save and invest and to participate in wealth building strategies so they can live out their, their, their senior years with dignity. What about taxes? You save, you invest, you make a big windfall. Now you get a 1099. It says you've got all this money sitting in the bank and it's drawn this much interest and there's a place on your 1040 to tell the Internal Revenue Service about that extra money that you, you uh, were clever enough to come by. Is there any way besides the tax sheltered annuities to prevent yourself from being, especially if you're in certain tax brackets, you know, if you're already in a, in a high tax bracket and then you have a lot of interest income, what happens, what do you, how do you protect yourself? Well, you protect yourself by, by, by having as much, as much of your investment into a deferred uh, situation, whether it's in a 401k plan tax shelter annuity as you've just uh, just mentioned or an individual retirement account you know the more taxes you pay that means the more money you've made mm -hmm. if you're not making any money you're not paying any taxes the important thing that people must understand with their, with our tax system the way it is here in the United States it's a regressive tax system the more money you make the more taxes you're going to pay so the mo most important thing that you need to do is to make as much money as you can the sad thing about paying taxes is if you have a certificate of deposit and you have fifty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars in it and each year you can't take that money out of your certificate of deposit but you get the 1099 and you've got to pay taxes on it that's a bad thing the good thing is that you ought to take that amount of money and make it work for you as hard as you possibly can. A lot of people seem to think that real estate is a good place to actually uh, save and invest their money. And real estate is an important element of everyone's portfolio. I think everyone should own their own home. I think that is the very first part of the American dream to you know, to me, the American dream is simply the ability to get a good education, the ability to get a good job, and the ability to retire comfortably. Unfortunately, that whole business about retiring comfortably is harder and harder to, to do these days. Matter of fact, we did a survey as I was preparing to write my book, Investing in the Dream, or, and, and doing my tape series, which is called Pathway to Your Dreams. We surveyed a group of people, and they told me that they believe that they would see an unidentified flying object, a UFO, before they would see a Social Security check. I mean, it's just that we cannot depend on the government to, to take care of us in our retirement. Did you know that in your death that the government will only give you $240 based on your Social Security for your burial. I was talking to some of my friends in the funeral home business and they tell me an average funeral today costs $7,000.
you know, it could cost as much as $10,000, depending upon whether you have a, a burial plot or not. So that's why it's, it's very important when you ask the tax question that people amass as much money as they can. A lot of times people don't understand that there's something called the death tax. The death tax is if you have over $600,000 this year and up to a million dollars uh, in um, over the next five years, by 2005, if you have more than that in your estate, you have to pay an estate tax to the federal government for everything that you do not have an estate plan for. Now, that's a terrible thing. Uh, it's You've worked all your life. You've bought a house. It's increased in value. It's now added to your estate. It's now worth two or three or four hundred thousand dollars just based on the you know the neighborhood how things go up you have some jewelry you have some land perhaps that you've inherited in your family some fur some other all of a sudden guess what you have six hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff it's now into a state tax territory and if you don't have proper estate tax planning by working with a financial planner like myself you could end up giving the government half of your estate that's why it's extremely important that people prepare wills, they do proper estate planning, and they work with a financial planner. That's why I wrote the book, Investing in the Dream. That's why wealth building strategies are so important in our lives. Because if we don't plan, the government will plan for us in our death by charging our families an estate tax for our, uh, our estates. What are some of the uh, elements of an estate plan? Well, the first element of an estate plan is having a will. It's important that each and every one of us decide within our own selves exactly how we want our property apportioned upon our death. If we don't apportion it, guess what? The governor will apportion it for us. The money will go into a big pile and the state treasurer will use it to pay off the state debt. If that's not what you want, then you need to write it down. You need to write it down. Make it clear exactly how you want your estate apportioned. So a will is the first element. The second thing that is extremely important is to list your assets. Too many of us do not list our valuables in an orderly manner, so many times we can't uh, can't find out, you know, you know where everything is. Now, I got to tell you here, I, you know, we're we're on, you know, national television here, but my mother was one of those people who used to carry around her life and her purse, and you know, God bless her, she's no longer with us now, but upon her death, I went for the purse. <laughs> <laughs> to find out exactly where the insurance policies were and where the bank accounts were and all that sort of thing. We should tell our children exactly what our estate is, what we have, where we have it, so there's not this big running around trying to find out what's going on. So I would say the first element is writing a will. Secondly is is listing, listing, assets. listing our assets. Uh, the, the other important part is if we have a sizable estate, we ought to consider gifting some of our property to the ones that we want to will it to before our death. We're allowed under the federal tax law to gift as much as $10,000 to our loved ones during our lifetime without them having to pay uh, the the gift tax mm -hmm. on it so that's a, that's another consideration that people but that, ought, ought to think about cash or stocks or cash whatever. stocks property oh, you know just part of your mm -hmm. part of your assets mm -hmm. the important thing as I said is that you need to get a financial planner uh, in your life too many people you know seem to avoid financial planning as if it's uh, you know uh, you know some some kind of plague or something but I think when we fail to plan, uh, it really uh, affects our, our well-being. And really, it's a worry uh, on, our, on ourselves as well. Another thing that I, I would like people to consider when they're, when they're looking into financial planning, and I spent a great deal of time of this uh, on, 
in my tape series, Pathway to Your Dreams, and in my book, Investing in the Dream, talking about long-term care insurance. Now, uh, used to be in, 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 in days past when we first, you know, made the major migration from the south to the north, whether it's Detroit or Cleveland or here to Chicago to work in the factories or whatever, that something happened to our parents or our grandparents that we would leave our jobs and go back down south and take care of them. Mm -hmm. You've heard of this, Dr. Mm -hmm. Pease. Well, that is no longer the case. I'm afraid that our children will not be doing that. Our children have mobile lives and we're going to have to find some way to take care of ourselves in our senior years. And the only way that we're really going to be able to do that is by preparing through some sort of saving or investing or long-term care insurance policy to prepare for that. Now, a lot of people don't like to think about that, but you know, we don't want to be burdens on our children, mm -hmm. and we don't want to be burdens on ourselves as well. Health care is extremely expensive these mm -hmm. days. So I think people not only need to save and invest to prepare for their retirement, but they need to save and invest to prepare for, for illness or any time uh, any kind of, of long-term care responsibilities that they might have. That's why I wrote the book, Investing in the Dream. Okay. You never told me what the NASDAQ was. <laughs> I don't want to let you out of here. <laughs> well, let's talk about the NASDAQ for a second. Okay. First of all, if you, if you look in the, in the newspaper, the, uh, in the business section, it starts out with a listing of the stocks on the New York Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. That's the NYSE. Mm -hmm. Then the second listing is for the American Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. That's called Amex, A-M-E-X. Mm -hmm. Then after that comes the NASDAQ. Now NASDAQ simply stands for the Electronic Trading System for Smaller Companies. So it's the National Association of uh, Electronic uh, trading. Mm -hmm. So NASDAQ is really the same as the Amex or the New York Stock Exchange, but it's for smaller companies that are newer to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So whether you're, you have a stock that is, say, an older company, say, for instance, General Motors or AT&T or IBM that would be listed on the American Stock Exchange, you would have a newer company such as um, Microsoft, uh, Apple Computer, some of the dot-com companies on the American uh, Stock Exchange, and then you would have the very new companies uh, or smaller companies on what we would call the NASDAQ Exchange. But there's still another uh, there's still another listing, and that's called the Pink Sheets, which is the very, very small companies, the ones that are just beginning to trade. Th these are companies that are generally uh, less than three or four years old that have started out with private placements and with venture capital and that are really trading in what we call penny stocks. That is to say stocks that are less than five dollars in value. I would caution people not to invest in these companies unless you have a very clear understanding that you are going to be involved in some major element of risk. If it's successful, you are got to make a lot of money. If it's not successful, you could have your money disappear rather quickly. Another element in looking at the stock pages is something called options, futures, and commodities. I may have to come back on another program and really go into detail on those, but let me just say that those particular elements of the, of the marketplace are extremely volatile. And I don't know if you ever saw the movie Trading Places with Eddie Murphy, mm -hmm. but if you recall that movie, Eddie Murphy was a a broker, and he what we what he was trying to do was guess the orange juice futures price depending upon whether it was going to snow in Florida in January or not. Well, then, let me tell you something: betting on the weather is not something that 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 I like doing. You know. It, you know, God is, has a way of, of handling things, and I, I choose not to, 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 to bet on the weather. So many of my clients, most of my clients, do not involve themselves in, in commodities, futures, or, 
our, our options markets. But you know, it's one thing when I when, when we bring God and spirituality into this whole thing. I have the occasion to give a lot of seminars. That's why I recorded my seminar program. In doing my seminars, I've had an occasion to speak at churches. And people have come to me and they said, Brother Brown, Brother Brown, look, this whole business about the stock market, I mean, you know, money is the root of all evil. They talk about it in the Bible, and I don't want to get involved in that at all. And it's just, you know, I almost say it's almost unholy. But, you know, it's hard for me to believe that God would create all these good things on this earth if he didn't want us as humans to participate. In other words, I don't believe poverty is a virtue. Not at all. I think it's important that we understand that God gave us a talent. God gave us blessings, and it's up to us to do something with those particular blessings. I'm, re I'm reminded of the of the parable of the talents in Matthew uh, where God gave one person five talents and he multiplied them and turned them into ten and God said what? Well done my mm -hmm. good and faithful servant. Mm -hmm. Gave another three and he multiplied them and made six out of them and what did he say? You will sit at my right hand in heaven. Then he gave another one one and that person what did he do with it? Nothing. He buried it and when the Lord came, he, he dug it out of the ground and presented it to him and said, Lord, here is the one talent. Here's the one blessing. Here's the money that you gave me from my, from my employment. Here it is back to you. And what did God do? He took it away from him, gave it to the one with ten, and said, you didn't even get interest, usury, you know, on, on, my, on, my, on the talent and the blessing that I gave you. In other words, what God was saying is that he gives us these opportunities and it's important for us to save and invest, to make the money grow, to prepare not only for ourselves and our lives and what we're going to do, but prepare for our generations to follow us, our children and their children too. That's why I wrote the book, Investing in the Dream. Well, I'll tell you what, you are right on target because you have wound up right within about 30 seconds left on this show and I think you have just about covered every question that I could have asked you although I would like to have seen that sheet that had the other questions to see what things I didn't find out that I might have found out if I had known to ask the question. Well, Dr. Peace that means you have to invite me back. Well certainly I'd be happy to invite you back. And I thank you very much for coming this time and explaining all of the things that you have regarding investments and finance and money and the NASDAQ and a lot of fuzzy things. I thank you so much for joining us on the H3O Show. Thank you, Dr. Peace. You're welcome. The Moja is the message, a call for unity. Message, got to get the message, the message to our brothers and sisters.